Good morning. I'm Pastor Ed Thomas, and we welcome you to Spirit of Joy in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Each week this summer, we invite your family to explore the attributes of God by way of our letters of the week. Today's letter is O. What can your family come up with as an attribute of God that starts with O? Then midweek is P for provider. We hope you have a very blessed week. of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God, power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and blessing and glory are His. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us 
from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son to die for us. And Christ so loved the world that he gave his very life upon the cross. Hear the good news. Dear friends in Christ, our loving Lord washes away your brokenness and forgives you all your sins. Come wash me in mercy. Let us pray. Please bow your heart with me. Great God, as we gather again in spirit through the marvels of technology, we pray for our community of spirit of joy and for our local, state, and national communities. Lord, we pray for our world. Bring peace, bring healing. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For those in our families and church family who are sick and hurting, and for those who are dealing with this disease and its aftermath, including the thousands upon thousands who are grieving. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We thank you, Lord, for medical professionals and those working in clinics and nursing homes, for the diligence of scientists aiming towards treatments and cures, for the storekeepers and farmers and truck drivers, for police officers, firefighters, and EMTs. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For those impacted economically in this time of shutdowns. Lord, bring world economies back. For those dealing with anxiety, fear, and depression, still their hearts and let them know your presence. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For churches across this world, Lord, that they may proclaim hope in this season of uncertainty. And for all church leaders, including those at Spirit of Joy, keep them strong so that they may keep us strong. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Dear family in Christ, we invite you to continue praying at home. First lesson is from the eighth chapter of First Samuel. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Samuel, you are old. 
and your sons do not follow in your ways, appoint for us then a king to govern us like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Just as they have done to me from the day I brought them out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so also they are doing to you. Now then, listen to their voice only. You shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson is from Romans, the eighth chapter. The Apostle Paul writes, We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. (laughs) What then are we to say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not withhold his own son but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who instead justifies. And who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. In Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel, Matthew, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which someone found and hid. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. And on finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught fish of every kind. When it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets, but threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all this? They answered, yes. And he said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the master of a household who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We are in the midst of the story. We have just been covering the period of the judges. We've heard about Deborah and Gideon and Samson. We heard of the time of Ruth. And now we are at the transition from judges to kings. There are two that stand kind of at that intersection. The first is a priest 
named Eli. Eli was the final, in many ways, the final of the judges. And it says that there was a time when a young mother, wasn't a mother yet, she was a woman barren and couldn't have children, went and prayed before God. And she prayed and she prayed and God said, Hannah, I've heard your prayers. You will have a son. Samuel was born and she committed, as she promised in her prayers, that son to God. And Eli the priest raised Samuel. There was a time as Samuel got a little older that he began to hear the voice of God. Remember this story, Samuel, Samuel, here I am. And he jumps up and he runs to Eli. Eli, you called me here in the middle of the night. They'd both been sleeping. And Eli says, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. And again, the voice, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel rushes over to Eli. And Eli says, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. And about the third time, he's like, whoa, <laughs> maybe that's God. Listen to him. And God essentially said the sun was going to set on Eli's kingdom, uh, his rule, his, his leadership, his priesthood, uh, that his sons were not in a position to follow. In fact, it says in Scripture that uh, his sons were evil. Uh, whenever a sacrifice was brought before the Lord, brought to the priest to bring before the Lord, his sons it actually says this, would take a three-pronged fork and bring the best of the meat out of the pot. Now, now don't ask Mary Louise. Uh, I sometimes cheat and do that when she's making a roast in the crock pot, but her roast hasn't been dedicated to the Lord. It's a gift for the family. I think I'm allowed, but don't tell her. <laughs> but when it was dedicated to the Lord, it was not allowed. It was stealing for God what was God's. And so as the sun set on Eli's time, up rose Samuel. Samuel was a great prophet in the land. But I love, and we saw a piece of this in our lesson from just a moment ago, uh, that says that when Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. And it says the name of the firstborn son was Joel, second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba, yet his sons did not follow in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted, just, ju <laughs> perverted justice. Then all the people of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, Samuel, you are old, and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king, so that we may be like all the other nations. <laughs> Isn't that what you tell your kids? Uh, well, if all the other kids are jumping off the bridge, you go ahead and jump off after him, because there's nothing like being like all the others. No. They wanted to be like all the other nations? God was their king, and Samuel went to God, and Samuel was sad because, God, they're rejecting me. God said to him, and we heard it just a moment ago, Samuel, they're not rejecting you. They are rejecting me as their king. They've been doing it, in fact, since I brought them out of Egypt. They have been following other people. They have been chasing after other gods. Samuel, they're not rejecting you as king. They are rejecting me, the Lord, as their king. So tell them, they can have the king that they want. But warn them what this will cost them. And as the verses unfold here, he's going to say, tell them that their king will take their sons and make them his soldiers. He'll take their daughters and make them his cooks and perfumers. He will take the best of their fields, the best of their flocks, and in the day that they cry out to me because of the king that they have chosen, I will not answer. And so Samuel went to the people 
and he warned them everything God said. And they said, no, we want a king so that we might be like all the other nations. Now, was this going to turn out well for them? <laughs> no, no. Their first king, uh, I mean, who would you choose? So here we are, presidential election year. Uh, if I've done this with kids over the years, if you got to picture perfect, make a king, uh, what would you want? Number one, I'd want someone that valued through their policies what God valued. Uh, I would want someone who had character and integrity. I would want someone uh, who was righteous, who was not corrupt. Uh, how many of us have struggled in so many elections in a row going, even the ones that seem honest, wind up taking these bribes and things. And it's hard. And so who did Israel get? Get this. They got the tallest, handsomest man in all the land. Let me read to you from chapter 9. It says, there was a man of Benjamin, tribe of Benjamin, whose name was Kish, a Benjaminite, a man of wealth. He had a son whose name was Saul. A handsome young man. There was not a young man among the people of Israel more handsome than me. He stood head and shoulders above everyone else. Tallest, handsomest man in all of the kingdom. There's your recipe for success. Uh, I'm not sure who the tall, handsome man in our kingdom is, but there are some days when I think, maybe that would be better. <laughs> now, Saul had God's favor. Saul had God's favor upon him. Saul marched out and Saul won victories. Samuel came and anointed Saul. He was God's anointed one. And Saul was proclaimed the king. Saul began to prophesy. Saul defeated the Ammonites and Samuel's farewell address, Samuel's saying, okay, you got your king, I'm checking out. He didn't check out quite yet. Uh, but there was a time when after a battle, Saul was ready to make a sacrifice to the Lord. And so Samuel said to him, Saul, here is what God commands. Go down to Gilgal. And you're going to have to wait for me until I get there. It'll be about seven days before I arrive. And when I arrive, I, the priest, will make the sacrifice on your behalf to God. So Saul goes down to Gilgal. And what happens? Saul's men get impatient. Saul gets impatient. Saul takes it upon himself to do the priestly role and make the sacrifice. And the anger of the Lord was kindled. God took his Holy Spirit from Saul. That's not something that we have to worry about, but you need to know that this is the way that it worked in Old Testament times. That God would send his spirit for a period and take it back off. Like the people who built the tabernacle. God sent his spirit on them, Bezalel and Aholiab, and when they were done building the things of the tabernacle, God took his spirit back off. God sent his spirit to Saul and took it away. Why? Because Saul disobeyed him. And so God says to Samuel, I want you to go and anoint the next king. And so, chapter 16, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? Samuel was grieving over him. This was the Lord's anointed. I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. And I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Remember uh, from a couple weeks ago, uh, Ruth and Boaz had a son named Obed. Obed had a son named Jesse. 
Now Samuel is coming to Ruth's grandson, Jesse. And she says, For I have provided myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If the Lord hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Here, we're going to work a little subterfuge to protect you, Samuel. Take a heifer with you and say, I'm just coming to make a sacrifice. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. So when Jesse and his sons came, uh, Samuel looked on Eliab. Now Eliab was the oldest son. He was the tallest and the handsomest of the sons. And Samuel thought, surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called the next son, Aminadab, and made him pass before Samuel. He said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. And then the next son, and the next son, and the next son. And finally, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, are all of your sons here? And Jesse said, hey, there's the little guy. <laughs> he said, uh, uh, the youngest, but he's out keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring for him, uh, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had a beautiful eyes and, and still was handsome. The Lord said, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of all the brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from this time forward. All right, a couple points here. The term anointed, they used to anoint kings, they used to anoint priests, they used to anoint prophets. Jesus, by the way, was a prophet, king, and priest, great high priest, and anointed one is the word Messiah. They weren't viewing David as the Messiah. They were just anointing him as king, but prefiguring what will eventually come through Jesus. Now, other piece, the Lord does not see as humans see. We look on outward appearance. God looks on the heart. How much of our strife in this country in the last few months, I record this at the beginning of July, this lesson here is end of July, who knows what will transpire between then and now. I'm trying to get ahead so that I can do other things to work on projects for fall. But how many of our problems have come from humans looking at others and judging by appearance? And then by part of our problem, uh, it's been a historical problem. We have seen others because maybe their skin color is different. Uh, people with disabilities. Uh, I've heard of people that are disfigured and no one can even look at them rightly. I heard that just from one of our young people, one of their dear friends is constantly, their first question is not, who are you, or what's your name, or what do you do for a living, but what happened to you? How hard is that when we judge by outward appearance? But God judges by what? The heart. And so it is totally wrong in our society to have prejudices based on the way people look. It's the outside that we're judging. God looks at the inside. Do you know what's also wrong in our society right now? It's pay, playing politics and opinions based on identity. That because you are not this or not that, or because you are this, you have some false sense of authority, therefore you're less. All of the, the, the gender politics, all of the, I'm, I'm losing the word right now, but... Uh, 
the identity politics. All of that is wrong. We are all equal in the eyes of God. No one is better because they're white. No one is worse because they're white. No one is worse because they're black. No one is, as I've heard some black saying going on, no one is, is better because they're black. We are all equal. And until we start looking like God looks at people on their hearts. I baptized a, a teenager just recently. And I told them that I was going to anoint them with a cross. I said, it's like a permanent marker that you can't see, but God says, can. He says, this now is the defining characteristic in your life. He said, in fact, I have a book that is about baptism. And the people are blobs. They're shaped like pawns. Everyone is a pawn. Some are bigger, some are smaller, some are wider, some are thinner, but everyone is this keyhole-shaped, pawn-shaped person. But the defining characteristic for the children of God is that cross on their head. God sees us all essentially as blobs. He, he loves us as his masterpiece. He sees beauty in us that we don't see in ourselves. But you see the point. What God really looks like is looks at is what's in here. So God saw what was in David. David, you know, went out and made a name for himself by being bold. He faced Goliath. He didn't even wear Saul's armor. Everyone was trembling at the Philistines. They had this great idea. Uh, let our best man fight your best man. And by the way, our best man is nine feet tall. And everyone in Israel trembled, right? And rightly so. David knew that God was on his side. We said a few weeks ago that we don't have to fear the world if we first fear God. It's not shaking and quaking at God. It's realizing that God is bigger than us. We respect him so greatly because he is mighty and awesome. We're in the palm of his hands, and if we fear God, we don't have to fear the world. And that was David. Remember that song by Casting Crowns? Oh, what I would do to have the kind of faith it takes to stand before a giant with a sling and a stone surrounded by the sound of mighty warriors, shaking in their armor. But the voice of truth tells me the true story, right? Okay, so David goes out. He conquers him. Saul gets jealous of David. Remember, the spirit has been removed from, from Saul. Now the spirit is on David. David is the favored one. Saul spends the rest of 1 Samuel chasing David around the Middle East. At the end of 1 Samuel, Saul is killed. Along with his brother, David's best friend, Saul is killed in battle. And David, after being chased around for a dozen years, what does David do? He weeps. David doesn't rejoice, my tormentor is gone. David weeps because this man used to be God's anointed. David rises to king. And David, the years of David, were Israel's best years, particularly if you view them in the eyes of military strength and advancing their position. David was a warrior. And wherever David marched, the hand of God was with David. Israel had never been as big and victorious. One time in the midst of Israel's greatness, uh, David said to the prophet Nathan, Nathan, you know what I think we ought to do? I think we ought to build God a house. I mean, I have this beautiful palace I think we ought to build God a house, build a temple. He's been living in the tabernacle for all of these years. It's barely a tent. I'm going to build God a house. Nathan said, wow, what a great idea. What an honorable thing. How many of us have ever wanted to do something for God? What a great idea. 
And then God came to Nathan and said, uh, Nathan, did you check with me on this? Nathan goes, no. We thought it'd be a good thing. He said, that's the problem. You thought. You didn't check with me. David is not my chosen to build this temple because he is a warrior. Blood is on his hands. There will be a temple, but it's not David who's to build it. Time passes on. Then David has a son. I'm going to get back to David in a minute. David has a son named Solomon. Solomon becomes the king. If you turn to 1 Kings 2, 3, 4, 5, God says, Solomon, I'm going to use you for great things, but I'm going to start with this question. One of like two times in Scripture where God essentially said, Solomon, I want you to treat me like a genie. I will give you anything you ask. And what did Solomon ask for? He asked for wisdom. I love that. Could have asked for anything in the whole world, and he asked for wisdom. God was so pleased that he gave Solomon not only wisdom, but he gave him riches. Many view Solomon as the richest man in the history of the world. God worked through Solomon. And Solomon did what? He built the temple. It was glorious. It was masterful. The richest man in the world building the greatest building. I remember it was, it was probably 20, 25 years ago uh, when Bill Gates was uh, the richest man in the world. I, I read one time that uh, he had like $100 billion in wealth. Like nowadays, that's nothing. <laughs> yeah, right. I uh, had a hundred billion dollars in wealth, but the same time I was reading, Bill Gates had a hundred billion. I was reading that I think it was in Kuala Lumpur or wherever they were building the largest skyscraper in the world, and it was going to cost five hundred million. And I thought, my goodness, Bill Gates could build a the largest skyscraper in the world in each of America's 200 largest cities. <laughs> Can you imagine? That means Charlotte and Matthews would probably have a skyscraper, not to mention Raleigh and Durham and Greensboro and Winston-Salem. Imagine these hundreds of foot skyscrapers. Well, here was the richest man, some say ever, Solomon built the greatest temple that you could ever imagine. It was a masterpiece dedicated to God. Now, you can go through, I urge you to go through, to read the prayer of Solomon when he dedicated that temple. It was, it was absolutely glorious. But Solomon had a problem. And... David's way of making the kingdom great was by warring. David, the father of Solomon, was a warrior. No one dared come across David. Solomon used his wisdom. His wisdom said, rather than fighting, it would be great to make treaties. And the way that they often celebrated treaties back in those days was by saying, as a symbol of our unity, I will give you my Egyptian daughter to you, Solomon. And so Solomon would take on a wife in one treaty, and another wife in another treaty, and another wife in another treaty. And pretty soon, the wisest man in the world had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Here we are, wisest man in the world, and he throws away some of the gift that God has given him. One of the most poignant books in the Bible is Ecclesiastes, and it starts off with Solomon saying, meaningless, meaningless, all things are meaningless. 
He took his life that was rooted in God and threw it away to find only meaninglessness. In the end, he finally of Ecclesiastes comes and says, the only thing that really does have meaning essentially is, is following God. But here we've had a couple kings in a row. We've had Saul. He threw it away by, by taking the responsibility of sacrifice, of priestly duty, presumptuously into his own hands. Solomon took the gift of God and he threw it away by doing what? Using his wisdom to form treaties that wind up tearing his down, life down to meaninglessness. And what about David? I want to tell you a piece of the story of David. It's one of the the most poignant, and we're going to settle and we're going to land here as we begin our journey on the, the kings. It says, 2 Samuel 11, verse 1, In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab, the general, with his officers and all Israel with him. So the time of the year when kings go to battle, it was customary. Where was David supposed to be? He was supposed to be leading his armies instead. He was fat, he was happy, he was settled, he stayed back. Okay? It goes on to say, uh, under Joab's leadership, they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Reba, but David remained at Jerusalem. Number one, problem one, and apply this to your life. He wasn't where he was supposed to be. How many times have you ever gotten in trouble by being in the wrong place at the right, wrong time? He was supposed to be, it was the time to be out at battle. He was in the wrong place, wrong time. You ever had a problem start like that? It says, it happened late afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking out, walking about on the roof of the king's house. Uh, let me read that again. It happened one afternoon when David rose from bed. It happened late afternoon when David rose from bed. Second is sloth, laziness. Here he was sleeping in the middle of the day. Why? Because he wasn't doing what he's supposed to doing. He had no purpose at this point. He had conquered everything he knew how to conquer. His kingdom was running itself because things were so good. Sloth. He had no purpose. He was walking about on the roof of his house, and I've, I've been to Jerusalem, by the way. I've walked up the hill where they believe David's uh, uh, his, his palace was. Uh, we had a couple older people in our group uh, that the rest of us in our group had to pull up that hill because it was so steep. So if you were on the rooftop on the palace here, you would see your own kingdom laid out straight before you. So David was on his house, and he saw from the roof of his house a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. Now, let me tell you something. It is not a sin to happen accidentally to see something. It's not a sin, right? You just look. Now, how many of you, if you look and you see something that you don't expect, kind of do this? Okay. Okay. The second take is not even sin because your brain's just confirming what you have. But how, what happens when you do this? Whoa. Well, that's what David did. It was that third look that was getting David into trouble. And then David, as he was looking, sinning, he's married already, David sent someone to inquire of the woman. I want you to see how progressive sin can be. Okay? He starts with being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Second, he's lazy and slothful, sleeping all day because he doesn't, he hasn't sought purpose in his life. Again, because he's in the wrong place at the wrong time. Third, it's that third glance that he can't take away. And then progressive. He sends someone to inquire. They come back and they inquire and says, 
This is the wife, this is Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. David knows Uriah. It's not that big of a town. He knows Uriah is a warrior. He knows Uriah is out at war. And so David thinks again. He has time to consider whether he's going to sin or not. And so then David goes, that guy's away. So David sent messengers to get her. And she came to him and he lay with her. How many steps did David have to check himself along the way? Well, you know the rest of the story. What does David do? Uh, he lays with her. She becomes pregnant. He's like, oh, this will be a scandal. I can't have a scandal in my kingdom. And so he brings Uriah back from the front. He's very clever. He says, okay, Uriah, come on back. Uh, report to me what's going on. And Uriah comes and reports, it's all going well, sir. Uh, these are your armies. These are God's armies. We're doing great. He says, good, now stick around for a few days. And while you're here, go hang out with your wife. <laughs> Uriah is too honorable. He's too honorable. He's more honorable than David. He's more honorable than the man that God said was after his own heart. That's what he said when God was rejecting Saint Saul. He was saying, I'm going to choose someone whose heart is yearning after my heart. And Uriah is more honorable than David. And Uriah keeps apart from his wife. There's no explanation anymore for why she's pregnant. And so David sends him back to the front and says, next time there is a charge, let Uriah leave. Uriah dies as David figured in battle. And so now he's clear and clear. Nobody knows. Any of us lie to ourselves about that. I remember one guy saying that he used to work with people who were addicted to pornography. He always asked them, when do you do this? They'd say, well, it's either when my wife goes running an errand or maybe after she goes to bed at night. And he says, it's because you don't want her to know, right? He says, yeah, yeah, nobody knows. And at this point, the, the pastor says to these men, he says, uh, listen, you need to fix your theology because God knows. God, through the prophet Nathan, came to David, told him the story about this man that had a cute little sheep and a rich man who when a stranger came, needed to take care of him, stole, the rich man had thousand sheep, stole the man, poor man's sheep. David was outraged and said, this man deserves to die. And Nathan said, that's you. Said, Uriah had one sheep. You have this whole kingdom. And yet you took his wife. And David, here's where I want to end this and the reflection on this. It is Psalm 51. It's probably the most famous uh, or at least poignant of the, the, the repentant psalms in scriptures. David cries out in the midst of this. In fact, the footnote, the pre-note at the beginning of Psalm 51 says, a psalm of David when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had gone into Bathsheba. It says, have mercy on me, God, according to your steadfast love. Wash me through and through from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. I have done evil in your sight. So you are justified in your sentence. But create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not from your presence. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. I watched it happen with Saul. Lord, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And sustain me with your willing spirit. What I want you to see all the way through this journey is not a bunch of heroes. Uh, 
Saul was God's chosen, Eli was God's chosen, and his sons were corrupt. Samuel, his sons were corrupt. Saul, he made sacrifices, taking the place of priests. Solomon <laughs> used all of his wisdom for the wrong goals and now couldn't even find a meaning. And David committed adultery and killed the husband. These aren't heroes, these are people. And the only thing in the end heroic about David is that he fell on his face and confessed his sins. And can I tell you something? There's nothing heroic in me or you. In little bits there is. But the imperfections outweigh all that we try and bring to God. And yet, our God loves us. And all he truly desires is for us to come to him and to fall on our knees, to confess our sins. And he will create in us a clean heart and a new beginning. Let us make that our cry. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. This is our prayer today and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with your willing spirit. Amen. with you and also with you lift up your hearts we lift them to the Lord 
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. It is indeed right and life-giving that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to You, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by His glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise Your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna. Remember how on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and after he blessed it, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. Each time you eat this bread, remember me. Again after supper, he took the cup and said, This is the new covenant in my blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink from this cup, remember me. Our Father, Father. who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may now enjoy communion at home. you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.